Welcome back. In this video, we're going to unpack some of Euclid's definitions and postulates from books five and book six that are related to ratio, proportion, and similarity. These are going to be the concepts that we need to have in place so that we can develop a firm understanding of how the sector works and begin using it quickly and efficiently to create line segments and other features of our designs that um, exist in, in um, whole number ratios to one another. So from book five, we'll start with two definitions here. Um, these are going to tell us um, about the concept of what it means for a geometric object to be a part of another. Uh, or a magnitude to be a part of another, and what it means for another um, ma magnitude to be a multiple of another. So a magnitude is a part of another magnitude, the less of the greater, when it measures the greater. And what Euclid means by one magnitude, this small one, the less to the greater, measuring another magnitude is that you could set a divider, in the case of a line segment, and step this magnitude off some integer number of times in order to cover the greater magnitude. Now this might be done with areas, it might be done with other measures as well, but the, the example with line segments uh, works well enough to get the point across. So this small magnitude measures the large magnitude because it can be used to tile or step off the, the entire space of the large magnitude. The second definition from book five elaborates on this concept and it says the greater is a multiple of the less. So this greater magnitude is a multiple of the less when it is measured by the less. So the, these are just two sides of the same coin. So Euclid, <clears throat> Euclid moves along with two more definitions, and these really begin to establish what he means by ratio. So a ratio is a sort of a relation in respect of size between two magnitudes of the same kind. So here's what Euclid means by that. Let's imagine that you had two line segments. Okay, they have a magnitude, their length. And you can compare their lengths. One is bigger than the other. Or you might have a couple of angles. Also have a magnitude, the measure of the two of each of the different angles. And you could compare those measures. This one opens wider than this one. Or perhaps you've got a couple of squares which have a me measure in a sense. We can think of their area as being their measure. This area is bigger than this one, so we can compare them. And in all three cases, I'm comparing two magnitudes of the same kind, area of a square. Those are the same kind. Measures of angles, those are the same kind. Lengths of segments. But I'm never comparing the length of a segment to the area of a square. That would be trying to compare two magnitudes of different kinds. Okay, so all Euclid is saying with this definition is that a ratio is a comparison between two magnitudes. And he, he insists that they should be two magnitudes of the same kind. Now he's not done defining what a ratio is. There's going to be magnitudes that you might want to compare that he prohibits comparison of. And that, that comes out in definition uh, four from book five. Magnitudes are said to have a ratio to one another which are capable, when multiplied, of exceeding one another. And then it takes, takes a little bit of time to unravel what he means by that. But what this essentially does for us is that it prohibits us from as using a ratio, it prohibits us from comparing a finite magnitude to an infinite one. And so imagine trying to do that. Imagine you had a 
finite line segment like this, and you wanted to compare its magnitude to the infinite magnitude of this infinite straight line here. Well, he's saying you can't do that because here is a magnitude that's clearly smaller than this magnitude. This finite line has got to be shorter than an infinite line. Everything is. But what I can't do is find anything to multiply this magnitude by to cause it to exceed the other magnitude. I can't take a finite line and multiply it by some finite number and ever expect it to exceed infinity. And so that's really what Euclid's getting at in this definition. He's, he's saying that, look, there's lots of times you'd maybe like to compare two magnitudes, but if you're going to use a ratio, we're still going to have to unravel a little bit more about what a ratio is, but if you're going to use a ratio, then you cannot compare finite quantities to infinite quantities. That's essentially the point of definition four here. Before we move on to Euclid's next definition relating to ratios, I thought it would be a good idea to point out that there's a fairly standard notation that we use more in modern times than something that was used by Euclid uh, to describe or to de denote a ratio. So imagine that we had two magnitudes, lengths of line segments in this case, A and B, and we wanted to compare them within a ratio. One way we would say that using words is to say A is to B. That's fairly common language uh, for indicating that you're talking about a ratio. A to B is another shorter version of that that you'll often hear people use. But then this symbol here, a colon B is read the same way, A to B or A is to B. Okay, so you'll often see me and other authors who are writing about geometry and ratios and later on proportion, they'll use this shorthanded notation to represent the ratios that they're describing in their work. Well, Euclid's next definition, definition five, book five, is typically a struggle for a lot of people. It's, as you can see, quite a mouthful. And it's also written in some unfamiliar, maybe arcane language. But it's also perhaps the most important definition that we're going to work with as we try to understand what ratio means in the context of Euclidean geometry. And so we're gonna take our time and unravel what Euclid's actually trying to say with this definition. And so the words are just that magnitudes are said to be in the same ratio. So this is the term that we're trying to define. So we need to remember those words, in the same ratio. So magnitudes are said to be in the same ratio, the first to the second and the third to the fourth, when if any equimultiples whatever are taken of the first and third, and any equimultiples whatever are taken of the second and fourth, the former equimultiples alike either exceed, are alike equal to, or alike fall short of the latter equimultiples, respectively taken in corresponding order. Okay, so like I said, it's quite a mouthful. There's probably some unfamiliar phrasing there. So we need to take a moment to illustrate what's actually going on, perhaps with a picture and an example. In reference to Euclid's fifth definition from book five, I've drawn this diagram that I'm hoping will um, clear up some of what he's trying to get at. And so the first part of this diagram involves four magnitudes. And I've carefully drawn the lengths of these magnitudes so that they are actually in the same ratio, these, these two, first magnitude to the second is in the same ratio as the second, third magnitude to the fourth. So the first to the second, third to the fourth. That was part of his, his wording. And in an intuitive sense, what I mean by that is that if we look at the way A and B are situated, I found a length that is a part of A. A is 
a multiple of that part, it's twice that part. Yet B is three times that same part. So for that reason, we would typically say that A and B are in a two to three ratio. Same is true for C and D. C is divided into two even parts. D is divided up into three even parts of the same size. So C to D is also a two to three ratio. So in a purely numerical sense, we would say that A and B, first to the second, and C and D, third to the fourth, are in the same ratio. Now, Euclid said a lot more about what in the same ratio meant. And he said if you took any equi multiple whatsoever of the first and third magnitudes, so if you take any number and scale the first and third magnitudes up by that same number, in this case, I've done that for the number two. I've taken this length A and I've stretched it out to be twice as long. Same thing I've done with C. I've taken C, stretched it out to be twice as long. So that's what Euclid means by equimultiple. Okay. And then any other equimultiple of the third, I'm sorry, of the second and fourth magnitudes, in this case, I chose one half. Here's half of B, so this magnitude is half this length, and here is half of D. So Euclid said that if you ever do that operation, take one number and multiply it to the first and third magnitudes, and another number and multiply it onto the second and fourth magnitudes, then they're in the same ratio if what always happens is that within these pairs, we, the first always exceeds the second. First always exceeds the second. Or they both end up being equal, which was not the case in this example. Or the first one in this pair ends up being smaller than this one, and the first one in this pair ends up being smaller than this one. So Euclid says, if that happens without exception for each of the pairs of equi multiples you choose, I chose two and a half in this case, but he says it's got to happen for all of the cases, all of the choices of numbers, then your four numbers here are in the same ratio. First to the second, A to B equals second, third to the fourth, C to D. So, this isn't a very useful definition for determining if two ratios are equal, but it's certainly a useful definition for determining when they're not. Because you can determine that they're not by finding one counterexample to what Euclid says has to happen all the time. In other words, if I ever did this operation of multiplying this a by a number, this C by a same, the same number, and then B and D by their own equimultiple number. And if, for instance, this one ended up being longer than this one, like we see here, but this one, C, 2C, ended up being shorter than 1 half D, well, that would be an indication that your four magnitudes can't be set up so that they are in the same ratio. So really what definition five does for us is that it gives us a condition that we can check for in order to determine if two ratios are not the same. Now we can, in a more modern sense, just do that by arithmetic. As I began this, this uh, discussion of this diagram with. If we're thinking about ratios as divide a magnitude up into parts and then divide the other magnitude up by that same part and find that it turns out to be a, you know, a, a different multiple of that part, so two parts to three parts, 
That's how we can determine the ratio that exists between these two magnitudes. So that if we can find a common part or a common mo module that measures both magnitudes, but just perhaps measures them in different multiples, like we saw here. This part measures A by a multiple of 2. Same part measures B by a multiple of 3. If we can find that, if we can find that common multiple, or that common module that um, measures two different magnitudes evenly, then we've found a ratio that is satisfied by those magnitudes. So then, if we turn around and look at two other magnitudes and find some other common module that measures those two magnitudes in precisely the same way, this one is divided up into two modules, so it's measured in a multiple of two. This one is divided up into three modules, it's measured in a multiple of three. Then A to B is in a two to three ratio, and so is C to D. All right, and so in a more modern arithmetic sense, that's how we typically think of ratio, and I'm just saying that it's mostly consistent with what Euclid um, was pre presenting to us as ratio. He didn't really use numerical examples like these, but they were still lying beneath the concepts that he was presenting to us. So the upshot of that is that I think from a practical design-oriented point of view, if you're working with ratios of two different magnitudes, and then you want to determine if those two magnitudes are in the same ratio as two other magnitudes, then get out your dividers and start trying to divide them up and see if they can be divided up in the same way. See if you can find a common module that measures your first two magnitudes in exactly the same way that perhaps a different common module measures your last two magnitudes, like we saw here in the two to three ratio. Okay, so that's about it for definition five. One of the main reasons that definition five is so important in our study of ratio, proportion, and later on similarity is that it gives rise to what we mean by proportion. And that's the subject of the next definition. Well, Euclid's sixth definition of Book 5 just states that magnitudes which are in the same ratio be proportional. So he's really just giving us another word to describe what he introduced in Definition 5 of Book 5. So in other words, if we've got four magnitudes, A, B, C, and D, such that A to B is the same ratio as C to D, then we say that those magnitudes are proportional. Now, let's think about some situations where we've seen this. Back in the very first video in this series, the brief tutorial, the brief design tutorial, where I drew up a design of a small sitting stool. The front elevation view for that design fit into a bounding rectangle. That was three units wide by two units high. So the width to height ratio equaled the numerical ratio of 3 to 2. So the, the magnitudes width, height, 3 and 2 are proportional. So that, that's really the correct way to think of proportion in classical Euclidean geometry. And likewise, just for another similar example, the side elevation view in the full-blown design tutorial of the, the standing desk it involved a relationship between the height of the desk and then the maximum reach that I could 
I, I could stretch, stretch my fingers out too and still be able to touch the back of the desk. So that, that was the depth of the desktop. So the height to depth ratio of that desk was eight. was equal to the numerical it was equal to the numerical ratio of 8 to 5 so we would then say that the the magnitudes height height depth 8 and 5 were proportional okay so after establishing definitions for both ratio and pr proportion we should pause for just a moment to think about what their connection is and what their differences are so a ratio is a comparison between two magnitudes. Specifically, it's a way of determining if you can find a common module, a part, that measures both of those magnitudes, but does so perhaps in different multiples. A proportion, on the other hand, is a comparison between two ratios among a set of magnitudes. So if you've got a set of magnitudes and you've found that there are two ratios, and if you found that there's a ratio that exists among them, then we say that they're proportional. So definitions eight and nine really just go and extend those ideas. Definition eight of book five tells us that a proportion in three terms is the least possible. And that really underscores the idea that a proportion is a comparison of two ratios. And if you're going to look for ratios among magnitudes and you're trying to determine if two, two ratios are in fact the same, leading to a proportionality relationship, then you need at least three magnitudes to make those two proportions in a way that isn't just completely trivial. And that's what's going on here. These three magnitudes, these three links, I've drawn them so that they're proportional. A is a multiple of this, this module. It's twice that module, where B is another multiple of that same module. It's three times it. So we would say that A to B is two to three. But that same ratio exists between B and C. B can be divided up by, really, this module here twice. One, two. C can be divided up by that same module three times. So B to C is two to three as well. For that reason, we would say A, B, and C are proportional. And there's really no way to make a comparison like that with fewer than three magnitudes. Otherwise, you're just looking at the ratio between, if we were trying to do it with two magnitudes, A and B, we would just be comparing the ratio A to B to the ratio A to B. And of course, they're the same. That's not a proportionality relationship at all. That's just saying the ratio is equal to itself. Well, definition nine of book five continues to explore this relationship between ratio and proportion even further. And it looks at an example like this one, where you've got three magnitudes that are proportional, that are in proportion. When three magnitudes are proportional, the first is said to have to the third the duplicate ratio of that which it has to the second. And so what this definition is telling us, it's giving us the name for a ratio that's going to exist between this magnitude and this magnitude, if you happen to know that these three magnitudes are already proportional. So if I know that A is to B and that B is to C are in the same ratio, then Euclid's just telling us that there is 
another ratio that exists between the first magnitude and the third magnitude. And it's not the same 2 to 3 in this example that exists between A to B and B to C. It's actually going to be A squared to C squared. That's really what he means by duplicate ratio, is we're, we're applying a ratio twice, and we really just do that by squaring the magnitudes in the ratio relationship. And we can kind of look at this picture and see that that seems to be the case. So since A to B is a 2 to 3 ratio, and so is B to C, we look at A to C, and a appears to be almost four ninths of C. Thinking that four ninths is a little less than a half, the length of A is a little less than one half the length of C. And if we got out our dividers and worked that out, we'd find that that was in fact the case. So that's what Euclid means by duplicate ratio. Well, after working through the concept of duplicate ratio, when you have three magnitudes that are proportional. A natural question to ask is, is there a such thing as triplicate ratio or quadruplicate ratio or quintuplicate ratio, if those are even words? And the answer is yes. And that's really the subject of definition 10 of book five. Euclid is trying to generalize our definition of duplicate ratio. And so he says, when four magnitudes are continuously proportional, so I'll try to illustrate what that means, the first is said to have to the fourth the triplicate ratio that it has to the second, and so on continuously, whatever the proportion. So here's what he means by that. If you were just to look at these three segments that I've drawn here, and that's a repeat of the figure that I used to illustrate the previous definition for, for duplicate ratio. Because A is to B, so it's a 2 to 3 ratio, and so is B to C, 2 to 3 ratio. So A to C is the duplicate ratio of A to B. It's, it's 2 squared to 3 squared, or 4 to 9. All right. Well, the pattern just continues when you're talking about continuously proportional magnitudes, we're saying that A is to B, so as B is to the next one, to C, as C is to the next one, D. That's what we mean by continuously proportional magnitudes. We can just write these ratios out in a, in a linked chain like this. So as long as we know that that's true, well, we still certainly get that A is to C, the first is to the third, the duplicate ratio it is to the second. A is to C is equal to A squared is to B squared. But then Euclid goes on and says A is to D, the first is to the fourth, the triplicate ratio that it has to the second. So A cubed to B cubed first cubed to the, to the second cubed. Numerically speaking, what that means is that this magnitude A is to D, the, the last one, A cubed to B cubed. Well, what is that? If A and B are in a 2 to 3 ratio, A cubed to B cubed has to be a 2 cubed to 3 cubed ratio, or 8 to 27. So A is to D as, is as 8 is to 27. Now, if I had the room and the time and the interest, then I could continue drawing line segments where each one is, in this case, one and a half times as long as its predecessor. That's what it means for this one to be in a 2 to 3 ratio with the next one that I haven't drawn yet. I could keep drawing segments that follow that pattern. And then the first to the last in that sequence is just going to be in this increasing power ratio relationship of the first to the second. So my next line, A to, I guess, E, if I were to draw it, would be in a A cubed to A to the fourth to B to the fourth ratio. 
the next one, a to the fifth, to b to the fifth, and so on. That's what he means by continuously proportional, and duplicate ratios, triplicate ratios, quintuplicate ratios, quadruplicate ratios, and so on. Now, that's a lot of sort of infrequently used terminology, I'd say. But the concept we're going to see, we use it quite a lot in design. It's a really important one. And one of the, I think, most visible applications of continuously proportional magnitudes is imagine you're trying to design a bookshelf or a chest of drawers where the bay for the top shelf or the height of the top drawer um, is shorter than the one immediately under it and that one is shorter than the one Im immediately under it and so on. This is a fairly common design that we see with shelves and drawers. You know, if you search for a shaker chest of drawers or a shaker bookshelf on the internet, I think you'll see what I'm talking about. But yeah, try to be a little bit more accurate with my picture. Yeah, maybe that wouldn't matter. If this height of this shelf bay is to this height of the middle shelf bay, and the middle shelf bay exists in the same ratio to the height of the last shelf bay, so if this is A, B, C, if A is to B equals B, to C, and we'd say that these shelf heights or drawer heights, whatever they are, are continuously proportional. And that is a common design pattern that's used with shelves and chests of drawers. And we'll do that in some of our design workshops that are coming up. There are, other, a t there are other techniques to accomplish this visual effect, or at least something that's very close to it, and we'll learn about those as well. But one of the most classical ones is this, where this to this and this to this are in the same ratio, or they're proportional. And so we'll want to be able to construct that relationship in some of our examples as we move on. So that's the last of the definitions from book five that we're going to want to look at. But before we can really start unraveling the relationship between ratio, proportion, and similarity, we've still got to say something about similarity. And that's the subject of book six. So we're going to jump ahead to book six without looking at any of the uh, propositions of book five. And look at two definitions from book six. Book six of the elements focuses on the subject of what it means for rectilineal figures to be similar. And similarity is strongly connected to the concept of ratio and proportion. So the first definition, definition one of book six, says that similar rectilineal figures are such as have their angles severally equal and the sides about the equal angles are proportional. And to see what Euclid really means by this, it's maybe best to look at just a, a specific example. But remember, this definition applies to all rectilinear fig rectilineal figures, not just triangles like we're seeing in this example. So it does pay to step back and remember that a rectilineal figure is any plane figure that's made up of joined lines and angles between them. And so these two, I've just done a freehand drawing, so it's not particularly precise, but I've labeled them in a way to try to indicate that they are similar triangles. And the reason for that is that if I look at the corresponding angles of these two triangles, 
So this angle and this angle, those are equal. Same is true with this angle and this angle, they're equal. And then finally, same is true with the third angle and the corresponding third angle. Those angles in a corresponding sense are all equal to each other in pairs. And then, the ratio between the corresponding sides, A to D, B to E, and C to F, those ratios are all the same. So those magnitudes, A, B, C, D, E, and F, are all, by our definition, they're all proportional. That's what it means in Euclid's terms for these two rectilineal figures, these two triangles, to be similar. Now in a more intuitive, perhaps practical sense, what similar is going to mean for us and the rectilineal figures that we'll draw is that if you take a figure and blow it up like I did here, scale it up or shrink it down in a way that preserves all of the angles, then they're going to be similar figures. So that's all similarity really means is, is the, the operation of scaling a figure up or shrinking it down without distorting it in any other way. In our next video, we're going to see that we start trying to make sense of what ratio, proportion, and similarity can do for us operationally when we're drawing geometric figures and more specifically, we're, we're attempting to use our geometric skills to design useful objects like furniture. And one of the main goals of book six is to give us some constructions that we can use in order to quickly and efficiently create proportionality relationships among different magnitudes. And this last definition that we're going to look at probably isn't going to seem like it's related to that, but it introduces terminology that we are going to use when we're building up those techniques. So definition four of book six says the height of any figure is the perpendicular distance from a vertex to the base. And so in a rectilineal figure, all a vertex is is the point where two of its sides meet to make an angle. And the base is typically some other side that's opposite that angle. So if you draw a perpendicular line from the vertex of an angle to some face opposite of it, then that line is a height for that figure in that particular orientation. And so I've got a couple of other examples where there are heights that are indicated um, for non-rectangular shapes, and we'll use that. We'll use that in our, our upcoming tutorials, um, mostly just as a vocabulary word. So that is the end. That brings us to the end of our introduction to books five and six through their definitions and how those definitions are going to be used um, for us to um, understand what ratio and proportion and similarity ultimately mean. Now where we will go, as I've said in the next tutorials from here, or we're going to start putting those definitions to work for us so that we can build propositions that allow us to somewhat efficiently establish proportionality relationships between different magnitudes of interest, typically magnitudes that represent lengths in our designs. I would say an even more important goal than coming up with actual ruler or compass and straight edge constructions that accomplish that, is that we're going to try to make sense of purpose-built tools for establishing those proportionality relationships, such as the sector that you've already seen in our introductory video for Unit 2. So that's one of the primary goals of all of the work that we're doing here, is to make sense of what the sector is, what it does, and why it works. So thanks for joining me, and we'll see you in the next tutorial.